Hey there, Bruce, and welcome to the demo for a game called Misery Chord. Uh, big thank you to Al Greyman for putting this one out to me. Uh, this is the demo version. The full version isn't out yet, but I'll put a link to both in the description. It's looking pretty interesting, and I'm very keen to get into it. It really didn't want to be recorded, though. It's being a real pain in the ass about positioning and such, so hopefully that's like centered properly and it doesn't cut anything off because that would really piss me off. All right, anyway, let's get into it, shall we? I don't know what to expect or how long it's going to be. Names, images, and the script are subject to change. That's quite a lot of subject to changeness. Misery Chord. A ledge projecting from the underside of a hinged seat in a choir store, which, when the seat is turned up, gives support to someone standing. A small room in a monastery in which some relaxations of the mona monastic rule are permitted. <laughs> I know so little about this stuff already. It's quite sad. Anyway, a small dagger used to deliver a death stroke to a wounded enemy. Sorry, just making sure it's still, you know, looking centered. Jesus Christ, I hope this comes out all right. <laughs> Usually it's real simple, you know, it all clicks together real well, but this one not so much. The story is set in a monastery in the 1400s. Characters will say, do, and believe fucked up things. Excellent. Violence, xenophobia, racism, sexism, and, sexism and other serious themes are part of the story. Oh man. <laughs> oh, what have you got me into? Come on. How many words do I have to bleep? It was a dreadful summer's night. That, that's not how the Shakespeare play starts, is it? The sun had set several hours ago, but there was still a heavy, wet, and infuriatingly slight heat lingering in the air. Such are English summers. The temperature never rises to meet those in faraway lands, but they manage to be uncomfortable all the same. Even the stately home is not free from discomfort. Some might say if you complained about the stuffiness with an earshot, this is that this is what makes England such a fair country. Even the seasonal annoyances God granted us are unique. At any rate, it was certainly too muggy to be wearing a heavy cloak. Yet a man on horseback had appeared, thick cloth drawn tightly around his shoulders and face on the road to the estate. He brought his horse from a gallop to a saunter as soon as he saw candlelight in the windows ahead. Coming to a stop, he tied his horse to a post and hurried to the front door of the estate. A servant called out to the man from behind the door he was pounding upon. Go away, by God, go away. Is the master of the house home? Is it, abso it is absolutely imperative I speak with him. I could not answer that even if I desired, sir. I must ask you to leave lest I send a rider to call for the guard. I can see candlelight in his window. I know he is here. I... Even if he was, it's an absolutely criminal time to be making house calls, sir. I must ask again politely for you to leave. Tell him a friend is outside waiting for him. A very good friend indeed. Sir? Whispers could be heard behind the door. The servant had been approached by someone else inside the house and they were conferring in hushed tones. After a moment, the door was unlatched and swung open to invite the cloaked man inside. The young page was standing just beyond the threshold, looking concerned. He held a little candle in one hand that flickered in the night air. A tall, refined gentleman stood behind him, sporting a bushy silver beard and, a sl and slick back hair. As he made his way inside, the cloaked man pressed a coin into the servant's hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I apologize for my staff. If you had sent a letter ahead. No, no, no trouble at all. I must apologize for arriving at such an unseemly hour, but I have something of utmost urgency to discuss. Of course. We can confer in my private parlor upstairs. Should I bring ref should I bring refreshments? I can... No. That will not be necessary. You may return to your duties. The servant bowed and scurried out, to the, out of the foyer. The two men took to the stairs wordlessly, the tall gentleman leading the way to the parlor. The cloaked man followed, his face still hidden. Once they reached the parlour, the master of the house walked around the room lighting candles before taking a plush seat behind a large wooden desk. He indicated for the cloaked man to sit in the chair in front of him. Instead, the man removed his disguise and sat on one of the more regal seats littered about the room. Beneath the cloak, the rider was quite handsome. 
He had youthful sharp features and long silky hair. He was quite a bit shorter than the master of the house, but carried himself in an equally stately manner. He had dressed modestly for travel, but he wore a series of very expensive rings on his fingers. The taller gentleman drummed on his own ostentatious rings on the desk, waiting for his visitor to speak first. Send a letter? An excuse meant solely for my servant? I am well aware letters would be inadvisable in these matters, as would travelling in the dead of night alone just to speak with confidants. You haven't sent any letters, have you? Or written anything down? No, no. I am not so foolish as that. Good. Not as anything that anything we discussed is untoward. Of course. But it's about appearances. You are quite correct. You must agree with everything I say in this must you agree with everything I say in this manner? As long as you say things that are agreeable, I'm afraid I have no choice. <laughs> the younger man pulls his face into a humorless smile, then leans forward. Let us bring each other up to speed. Yes. Yes, of course. The heroic capture of Berwick, early on in the proceedings aside, the Scottish campaign is going quite terribly. The king is still alive. I doubt he dare lead a siege himself. He bears no words aside from his pride. I take it you were hoping for a slightly different outcome. I've said nothing of the sort. But I would not worry. For my part, I can tell you this excursion into Scotland has been disastrous at home as well as abroad. The general sentiment is becoming mutinous, I assure you. That is good news, although sentiment means very little in the grand scheme of things. From what I hear, I should not be surprised if action is taken, eventually. 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 Sooner rather than later would be my honest guess. The King's habits create one of the easiest targets I've ever witnessed, if I may hazard saying such a thing. You may. Do you know of someone? No. And rest assured that if I did, I would not say so. But we have created quite a window of opportunity for others to act. If I were a betting man, I would quite comfortably place money on the King passing in months. The younger man nodded and furrowed his brow, deep in thought. We have left a lot up to luck between us. In truth, I have found that most politics come down to creating good bets. Nothing is absolute. There are too many things moving of their own accord to truly know anything, let alone control anything. But if we can nudge just the right things in just the right direction, we can find a way to get what we want with none being any the wiser. What do you want? The same thing you do. To correct the king's grave mistake before it's too late. This is about justice? For you? Course correction. And I'll admit, what is best for you, is best for me. My god, man. You just buckled after two questions. <laughs> Only because I wish to answer you truthfully. If anyone else ever inquires. The younger man looks irritated and waved his hand as if to swat away flies. Bah. Speaking of politics, if I may caution you, while it is certainly convenient that the king is ripe to be acted against, there is a chance that certain elements might bubble up again were it to happen. In fact, I dare say those elements might be the very thing to act against him. It could cause more problems further ahead if we aren't careful to the utmost. As carefully as I can tug at strings, we can never truly be sure what will happen when things snap back into place. Lancaster loyalists? Are there truly enough courtiers banging that drum to worry about still? I'm afraid so. To be frank, I'm surprised you hadn't considered that angle. Surely those whispers haven't disappeared entirely in your circles. I've been very busy with other matters. Besides, whispers or not, I thought the matter was settled a decade ago. Some matters never truly settle. All the more reason to make sure the nation has a strong lineage to look forward to. I agree wholeheartedly. God almighty, I would have thought Scotland was enough to deal, had enough to, was enough to deal with on its own. Speaking of lineage, however, his son, that matter is being attended to, I assure you. So certain you are. I thought these things weren't meant to be touched directly. They are not. However, I have discovered a piece that can be nudged. I am not seated at the chess game, but you can influence the player. All right, all right. This is nothing too horrible you're referring to, I trust. Of course not. It's a question of lineage that might be brought to light. Nothing more, nothing less. However, however, well, I wanted to propose something to you. A contingency, if you will. What sort of contingencies are you expecting? I assure you there is no reason to worry about this presently. This is merely an opportunity I noticed upon examining the favours I'm owed. Hmm. 
The master of the house took a roll of parchment up from his desk and spread it across the desk in front of him. It was a copied map. The man's visitor arose from his seat to join in looking at it. It was quite messy and ugly, perhaps poorly copied. Nevertheless, both men studied it without question. Should you ever need a place to lay low for any reason, I have just the place. Do you foresee me needing a place to lay low? What is this about? This is just proper planning. He pointed to a spot on the map deep in the northern hills of England. A monastery? An abbey well, of, well away from any conflict of note. It is, a rem, rem, it is remote, far away even from the village it serves, and sparsely attended. You would be made quite comfortable for the duration of your stay. You are owed some odd favours. I am known to the bishop who offers the Eucharist to the nuns there, that is all. He has sought my help in a few matters, and I in his. And it's your turn next, I take it. I assure you, this is as safe a place as you could possibly find. Very peaceful little community. Far away from angry Lancasters. Or anyone, for that matter. Perhaps if you were to take, say, a holiday soon, so nobody could possibly blame you for anything that might happen to the king in our window of opportunity. Enough. I'll consider it should the need arise. Wonderful. The young man reached into his fashionable doublet and produced a small purse which he dropped onto the map in front of his host. This is not for services rendered. This is a gift for a friend who provides stimulating conversation. My thanks to you. Now then, while I have you here, would you care for a drink? England, 1483. Time for a coffee. <laughs> I love these title cards so I can take a coffee break. You thought to come and keep me keep me company? I'm flattered. But I don't need your sympathy. Everyone to a, degr a degree is lonely. My situation is not unique. No matter how many people they surround themselves with, no matter how sociable their daily lives are, everyone has an emptiness inside them that cannot be filled. We're insatiable. The more people we meet, the hungrier we become for more. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you there because, you know, I'm not a people person, <laughs> generally. More laughter. More nods as we pass each other in the hallway. More shoulders to cry on. More promises. Once you've tasted companionship, it's impossible not to yearn for it constantly. So, I'm not special. You needn't waste your time with me. Or is it that you're lonely too? <laughs> And perhaps you'd just like to change me to change the subject to something a bit less melancholy. <laughs> That's a shame. I'm sorry. If you want company, you're stuck with me for now. There's no point in belaboring all of this. What's done is done. But, well, I suppose I'm not going anywhere. You understand the duties of an anchor anchoress, I'm assuming. The fuck's an anchoress? A female anchor? <laughs> <laughs> it's to stop the ship getting away, obviously. It's more or less what we're doing right now. You have questions and I have answers. That's it, really. I used to have a more flowery opinion of the work, but that's all it boils down to. I would read scripture and copy scripture to prepare for moments like this. Reading and writing. Questions and answers. Thank God I have the answers. Questions without answers make me feel the loneliest of all. It all began about a year ago. But the questions that don't have answers yet are the most interesting questions, aren't they? Answering questions is my life's purpose. I sat in this room and studied scripture day in, day out, hoping that when someone came to me with a question, I'd have an answer. And let me be perfectly clear, this was a purpose, not a vocation. There is a right of consecration in everything. <laughs> That's right, speaking to someone who was a bit like a living saint. Are you moved? Do you feel particularly rapturous? A wed? Well, please don't. I don't live that way anymore. Just because I'm stuck in here again doesn't mean I get all that back. I turn my back on my duties, all because I got caught up in a worldly mess I had no business with. Anyway, before all that, I never left this room. I lived in here as long as I could remember. Meals delivered every day through the squint. The Eucharist performed the by the visiting bishop through the squint. Laundry passed back and forth through the squint. Sorry, squint is a disgusting word. I don't like it. The hagioscope is the proper term. It's what we're talking through right now. 
It sounds like you're talking through an arsehole. Squint sounds like a euphemism for arsehole. That's an awful euphemism for arsehole as well. I don't mean to be dramatic. But I've always assumed I'll die in here. Why wouldn't I? I had everything I needed. Honestly, that's not a complaint. I love my work, even if most of the questions I got were incredibly frivolous. I doubt the other sisters win arguments. Is God really never mentioned in Esther? That kind of thing. He isn't, in case you're wondering. I remember every question I'm asked. I was just happy to get them because I was, yeah, lonely. I didn't realise it at the time, but I was. The excitement I felt when someone arrived with a question for me was, I thought, the manifestation of my duty as an anchoress. But actually, it was just sad. A sense of fulfilment for being theologically helpful. That might have been part of it, but really, I was only hoping to have someone to talk to. Anyway, nine times out of ten, the questions I answered were nothing but idle conversation. But one day... Hello? We're gonna get an interesting question. I had no idea who it was at first. I can't see through the hagioscope. It's for privacy's sake, you see. If some poor soul were to come with me with a question about his marriage, do you think it'd be fair if I could see him? If he could see me, do you think he'd be able to ask me what he really wanted to ask me? No, of course that's never happened. Who's going to walk all the way up that hill just to ask for marital advice? <laughs> the point is, I have no idea what's on the other end of this. The door on your end locks, save for a little hatch to speak and pass this and that through. You're quite muffled, by the way. Speak up. Don't worry yourself too much about it, though. There's not much to be done about the echo. <laughs> Sorry. If you're waiting for me to have some revelatory moment of recognition based on your voice, you're out of luck. Unless you tell me directly, I won't know who you are. Actually, you know what? Please don't tell me. Perhaps I'll guess later. We can make a game of it. It's dreadfully boring being back in here. Plus, for all I know, you could be... well... If I knew that for certain, I wouldn't be telling you any of this. But you've caught me in a chatty mood, clearly. I'm willing to throw caution to the winds. Let's just leave it at that for now, and return to the story about a different visitor. Is anyone there? Um, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's probably a silly question, isn't it? No, not at all. I could have been sleeping. I suppose that's true. You'd still be there, though, if that were the case. Oh my, very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> Someone came prepared, didn't she? <laughs> yes, I was a little more chipper back then. <laughs> What's it like in there? I, um... What do you mean? In your cell. What's it like? Well, it's... Nice, I think. You think? Well, I don't have a... Much of a point of comparison, if that makes sense. You have books. <laughs> That's an understatement. I have lots and lots of books. And you've read all of them? Many times, yes. So you have lots to compare your existence experience to, surely. There are lots of nice places and books. Well, I suppose that's true. I've never really thought about it that way. The nice places in the text I tend to read. Religious texts. Christian scripture, yes. There are plenty of nice places in the Bible I can think of. Nice to look at, certainly. Comfortable. But spiritually? Not very nice. You're telling me you wouldn't have liked to have seen, I don't know, King Solomon's palace? Definitely not. It sounds beautiful, but it was built on sin after sin. In Kings 11.4, vanity of vanities. I know, I know. Ah, sorry. I assumed you weren't one of the sisters if you, if you were asking about, about visiting Solomon's palace. This is unlike any conversation I'd ever had previously. It was so casual yet so exhaustive. Or rather, the words themselves weren't detailed. But it was a conversation only people enamored with little details could have. Relaxed, but practiced. After a while, she thanked me and left. Then she started showing up regularly. I don't remember every last thing we talked about. Usually she would ask one or two questions and things tumble forward from that point. We would chat about scriptural specifics, argue lightly over minor interpretations of the Bible, and even talk about the finer points of translating Hebrew and Greek into Latin. We didn't always agree. In fact, I'd say we mostly didn't. But it never felt contentious. It felt like we were two swordsmen having a rigorous sparring session. In fact, I did bring that up once or twice. Isn't it funny that the Bible refers to so many soldiers as comely? Why is that funny? Well, you know. A man wrote it. Oh, um, 
I don't know what you're implying. <laughs> yes, you do. And I don't think that's appropriate. What isn't appropriate? No, really. All I'm saying is that it's nice of Samuel to call soldiers comely. <laughs> oh really, you are terrible. It's simply an embellishment for the reader. <laughs> no it isn't. Not a single error. Not a single lie. It's not really a lie though, is it? It puts a picture in your mind the soldier is attractive. Doesn't something immediately spring into your head? Something does, that's for certain. <laughs> oh stop. <laughs> Do you imagine handsome soldiers very often? You sound experienced. This is... <sighs> this is what? Anyway, it might not have been Samuel. That's true. It could have been Nathan. Or Gad. Do you think one of them snuck into his house and added comely to some of the descriptions while Samuel was sleeping? Some kind of prank. Some prank. That would get someone killed. We're just having some fun. Hmm. Does that seem right to you though? No, I feel horrible having jokes about it to tell you the truth. I'm all on edge. No, I mean, does it seem right that a man would probably be stoned to death for... Let's suppose calling another man handsome. Well, that's just not true. Samuel wrote it and wasn't stoned for it. Samuel gets away with it because it's scripture. People hear it and go, ah well, the Bible is inerrant, so the soldier was handsome. If two Israelite soldiers met and one said, my, you're handsome, he'd certainly get a slap across the face. <laughs> is that what you would do? To a man who called me comely? To a woman. If anyone called me comely, I'd likely just be confused. Oh come now, don't give me that. Self-deprecating humour gives me the shivers. It's the coward's way of asking for praise. No, I just... am not very attractive. So if someone called me comely, I'd know they were a liar. I do wish you'd see me rolling my eyes right now. You'll get nothing from me behaving like this. I had no idea what her game was. These weren't theological questions. Honestly, the questions didn't seem to mean much of anything at all. She'd asked them, and by the time it was time for her to leave, we would have charted a course around every possible discussion except one that answered the original inquiry. I didn't mind. But I didn't understand either. I still don't. How long have you been stuck in there? As long as I can remember. I don't think I'm stuck though, I serve the Lord in solitude. It's as fulfilling as it is necessary. Have you ever left? I should think not. Never. Absolutely not. Well... I thought you might leave for meals occasionally. Not at all. My meals are given to me through that little door you're behind. Communion as well. How do you use the privy? The... I... How do you shit woman? <laughs> I have a chamber pot. It... Gets taken away when my meals are delivered. Let me get this straight. You swap your... Don't... Talk about this. And someone has to carry it all the way to the privy to dump it out. Be gone. I don't want to think about it. You know, I was feeling quite sorry for you and your hermit, hermetic lifestyle. But you get to read and write all day, and your meals are delivered to you. How else would I live? And your waste collected? Well, you're practically weighted on hand and foot. My liege. You say that as if I live in luxury. Besides, I didn't ask for this life. It's a responsibility. Ah, they all say that. Noblesse oblige and so on. Tis ours the dignity they give, they give to grace. I'm drawing a blank on that one. Oh, it's not a Bible verse. It's the Iliad. I'm not familiar. Goodness, they didn't even give you any fun books. I bristled at that one. Scripture was fun. <laughs> nothing, nothing that doesn't serve my earthly purpose, no. There's no way to go through life, even as a woman of God. What good is, what good is Scripture if you can't apply it to anything else in life? The Bible is my life. I can sense the strain in her voice at this point. If you'll excuse this wet wretch a moment of self-pity, I am more than aware of how difficult I was to be around. Not that that changed. Not that that's changed. <laughs> that's all well and good, but you've got an awfully narrow view of the world from that cell. Do you have a window to the outside, I mean? Of course. That's good at least. Have you ever seen the sun? I just told you I have a window. I see lots of sunlight. No, no. No. I mean the sun itself. In the sky. I'm awful with directions. Does your window face east? I... or west? You'd see the sun one way or the other if it did. No. I haven't. Well. Don't worry. One day you will. What's that supposed to mean? What do you do for fun? Well I... unless that's private. 
Talking with you is fun. It's very nice to hear. I think this might be the only time I ever knocked her off balance. I could hear it in her voice, even though it was muffled by wood and echoed through stone. Her commanding tone softened and her voice grew thinner. Have you ever read any plays? Plays? No. I've only read about amphitheatres in passing. But you understand the concept, surely. It's very Roman. Ha, <laughs> Greek. But yes. People dressing up and performing. I'm not sure how to feel about it. Feels a little dangerous. Spiritually, I mean. Well, if it makes you feel any better, a lot of plays since ancient Greek times have been about the Bible. That's nice, I suppose. Oh, careful. <laughs> Don't let His Holiness Innocent the Third hear you say that. Uh, is that bad? What did you just trick me into saying? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. He's been dead for, oh, 300 years? I'm sure Sixtus won't mind. He's much kinder to the theatre. That wasn't funny. It's like you're goading me into blaspheming. I'm sorry, I sort of assumed you would know who the Pope is. I receive very little news in here. If it isn't a matter of complete catastrophe, I probably won't hear about it. As long as the Pope is the Pope and the nation is still part of the church, news is not exactly material to me. What nation are we in? England. Do you know what year it is? 1482. Come now, what do you take me for? What month is it? Uh, oh dear. I mean, that's not too relevant to me. Mostly I just look outside to tell what season it is. I get a special meal on Christmas. That much I know. I brought it to you last year. How often have you visited me now? <laughs> I'll never tell. Have it your way. What month is it though? October. Sam Hain, to be specific. Ooh. Oh, stop. Has anyone ever pulled any mischief night pranks on you? Mercifully, not to my knowledge. I get plenty of mischief from you though. Fair play. Listen, I need to move on, but I'll bring you a play to read next time. I know. Just the one. I know. I can trust you with handling a book with care at the very least. Alright, I'd like that, I think. Can I ask you something? Of course. Would it be alright if I opened this? The squint? No. I'm really sorry. <laughs> is that another rule? It is, but I earnestly can't. It locks from that side. I can't open it myself, it needs the key. Of all the luck, I should have thought of that last Christmas. And really, I'm not meant to look through. Of course. You're a very good rule follower too. Then again, if you were to bring me a book, I suppose you'd have to open it, wouldn't you? And I wouldn't be able to do much about it if you saw me taking the book, would I? That is true. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to me in that case. Alright then. Promise you'll read it? Yeah? Of course. Lovely. I can't wait to discuss it with you. That's the important part of reading, scripture included. Don't ever forget that. I, uh, I'll try not to. There's a good girl. Anyway, goodbye. For now. I'm late for Vespers. Goodbye. She never did bring me that play. Not her fault, I suppose. When I went to sleep that night, all I could hear was an incessant scratching. I should have known then that the devil wanted me. He'd been trying to claw his way into my cell my whole life. An elaborate plan to get to me was taking shape. Scratch, scratch. It echoed down the hall and throughout myself for what seemed like hours, shaving away at the walls, breaking down the barrier that had kept me safe in here. God knows how many years. Inside my head, I dreamed of terrors, bad omens. I should have known. And with that, we're going to wrap this one up here because we're out of time uh, for this episode. But we'll be back to this in the next one. Very curious. Very much like the writing in this one. Curious to see where this goes. I, From what I saw on the Steam page, it looks like the actual full game is going to be a collection of s short stories. Or something like that. But if they're like this, I'm all about it. That's really good. It's really good. Thanks again to Al Greyman for telling me about this one. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow to continue where we left off. Till then, thanks for watching, Bryson. I'll see you in the next one.